Uh, welcome back after the spring break. Uh, I hope you had a delightfully wonderful time. Don't tell me you were studying during the time. I, we, we, I'm not going to believe it. I think I saw most of you uh, on the beach. Some of you were in Galveston. Some of you were in uh, Florida. And um, oh yeah, that's I, I was checking up on all of you. So now that you've had a good time, Let's get started on where we left off and hoping that today we will finish part one of this course. As I said, uh, and that part, the two parts to it. One is the, the, the part dealing with the definitions and concepts and the language of finance. Uh, we are almost finished uh, on that subject. Normally, this is about the right time. And I finished that, that makes half the almost half, a little more than half of the course to develop the language. And, uh, and just a few items are left. Definitely, we'll be completing those two, two, three, four items. Uh, items meaning words in finance, like private placement and a few others like that. And then we move on to section two, which will be uh, when we will talk about uh, uh, topics such as oil price. I'm sure you all want to talk about it uh, as much as I want to talk about it also. Uh, you will get a, a very different opinion uh, in my opinion about that. I, I know that and uh, because what I am will teach will be not mainstream on that subject. It will be just an opinion. It does not mean I'm right or wrong. Uh, you may have uh, your own opinion and that's okay. Okay, and uh, we, then we'll talk about mergers and acquisitions. These are the topics that most everybody likes to hear about, where companies such as Exxon and Chevron and you know, all these companies around the globe, the big ones, why do they merge uh, and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about more, it'll take them maybe more than one, one complete lecture on the subject of project finance, just that. And you say, well, what have we been talking about up till now? No, we have not talked about project finance. I'll tell you the difference, what we have talked about so far. In just a minute, I'm going to start. And then what is it we are going to talk about is project finance, OK? And my plan is uh, uh, we'll start that subject of project finance. they will flow into next uh, lecture. And the one after that also probably. Okay, it's, and we have to look at different angles from uh, such as what do bankers look for in a project? What should you take to the bank and say, this is my project and uh, please give me some money. So what kind of question is it going to pose to you? So get prepared for all of that. What are the risks in project finance? Uh, what kind of uh, well, what are the different types of project financing techniques? And there you are. So all these subjects will be discussed gradually in starting today, very initial starting today, into next lecture and the one after that. Okay. Having said that, uh, give me just a second. I can hear something behind me. Oh. Well, excuse me for that interruption, please. Okay. Um, so let me get back to where we left off and uh, the remaining part of the so terms and concepts of finance, the first part of this course, the and halfway, a little more than half a mark. Okay. So far, we talked about our sort of so many definitions, as you might remember, and a complete lecture on bonds and leasing and preferred stock and common stock and partnership and limited partnership. And, well, you know, and I, God, I forgot leasing, less or lessy, and on and on. I can give you a long list of what we have covered, the language. But last time before 
in the spring break, there were three or four items there that were mm, not addressed. And let me do that now. Uh, one of them is, uh, what are the new financing techniques, financing of projects, uh, the subject? Uh, just like, uh, uh, you think of laboratories where you come up with new ideas and new projects. Every profession, including finance, are constantly looking up for new ways uh, to finance projects, new ways, okay? Uh, let me uh, talk about one of them. Write down, please, and then I'll explain what it is. Oil priced linked financing, oil price linked, L-I-N-K-E-D, pricing, okay? Uh, this is relatively new. Not that every bank does that, especially when you talk about oil ventures, oil project financing, you only talk about a handful of very large banks, some European, mostly the American, uh, it's not the bank down the street from where you lived that is going to be involved in these kinds of financing techniques like oil price linked financing. So let me explain what that means. We didn't have that in the past. A few years back, the bankers got, started, uh, got smart and they introduced this. I mean, the main impetus, the reason was that when the price of oil would go down, and the companies were unable to pay back the loan, the principal and the interest, and the, the banks didn't get the money back. The loan was never paid back. And so they said, well, we must find a way where we are somewhat protected. And therefore came up with the idea of linking the interest rate now to the price of oil. What does that mean? Oil price linked financing or oil price linked interest rate. Let's say if you came to me as a banker, I'm the banker, you're uh, borrowing from me and I'll have a seat. We'd like to have a cup of coffee you know, and all that usual pleasant conversation we indulge in uh, when we meet somebody. And uh, five minutes later, I said, well, how can I help you, Mr. Borrower? He said, I go out to borrow some money and show me your project, I ask. You show me your project. And uh, I look at it, looks good from the bank's point of view. And I tell you, well, okay, we will be pleased to lend you the money, no matter what you want, that's it. $100 million, we'll lend it to you after I've seen the project and we'll charge you an interest rate of 8%. And of course, you're quite happy. You have a commitment from the bank, that's me, that you will be getting the money for the project you can start. At 8%, I said. So as you're getting up to uh, go back to your office to tell the engineer in charge of the project, Mr. Engineer, go and start your project. And what am I going to tell you as a banker before you dash out the door of the bank? I say, hey, Mr. Engineer, Mr. So-and-so, don't run from the bank so quickly. Please have a seat. Again, I may remind you, when a banker says have a, have a seat, it's not good news. Always remember that. So what's the news now? After you sit down, I say to you, that remember I said we'll give you the money, the, the money you wanted, the loan, at 8% interest rate? And he said, oh, of course, yes, I remember that. So now what will I say now? Well, you, I, you didn't let me finish the story, Mr. Borrower. That 8% interest rate is at today's oil price, which happens to be $50 a barrel. And then you say, so what? 
what's new? And I say to you, Mr. Borrower, the new is this 8% is interest at today's oil price of $50 a barrel. And if the price of oil becomes $60, $60 a barrel, the interest rate will be not 8 but 9%. That's new. And then if it goes to 70% and $70 a barrel, the interest rate will jump even further to maybe 10%. Linking the interest rate to the price of oil is a relatively new way to finance project by the bank. The oil price linked interest rate. I know that every single young person in this class has a logical question you have in mind. I know that. If you don't have that question, you're probably fast asleep. And that question I'm telling you is, and you know it. And you hurriedly say, Dr. Malik, what about the banker saying, or you saying to the bank, Mr. Banker, what if the price of oil goes down below $50 a barrel? <coughs> Would the interest rate go down? That's a logical question you're going to ask. Always it is asked. That's where the banker said, no, ma'am, or no, sir. No, 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 no. If the price of oil goes down below 50, the interest rate will be still 8%. So only when it goes up, the bank will benefit. If it goes below a certain threshold interest rate of 8%, you go down with it yourself. In other words, the interest rate will not go down. It will still be at that originally determined interest rate of 8%. So, the, and so there is a threshold where the bank will say, no, below that, price going below $50 is your problem and not mine, okay? This is what is what I would call in the new financing mechanism or method, okay? Uh, I'm lumping it under new financing, this is one of them. I introduced to you earlier on before the break, much before the break, uh, the limited partnerships, remember, where you avoid somehow you know, avoid paying double taxes. Yes, that is also new. Um, the reason we, we do that, like the MLPs or um, limited partnerships, they're very much an American thing. But you know why? Because as I told you, I think I did, that in 1981, we, we were drilling close to 90,900. 90,000 oil and gas wells. Can you imagine a year? Four to four, 5,000 rigs operating a day. So what is the point? To drill so much, you have a lot of, you have to have a lot of money, capital. So therefore our oil industry folks and the bank community, we're constantly, constantly for looking for new financing ways or methods or techniques. MLP is one of them. You know, MLP is a public limited partnership. You know, you know what is a limited partnership. MLP, Master Limited, we've not talked about it, so I need not discuss it again. So let's go to a third kind of a limited, third kind of a new method to finance is in the United States, well, in Texas, uh, we call it the equity kicker. Equity is E-Q-U-I-T-Y. Equity kicker, K-I-C-K-E-R. K-I-C-K-E-R, it's just a slang word. Or you can say equity share, you can call it, if you don't like the word. Kicker just say equity share. That's another way to finance projects. Fairly new. Let me, it's so easy to explain, nothing difficult. Let's say you're in Europe, let's say you're in the North Sea. 
There's a lot of activity, oil activity in the North Sea between Norway and the UK, you must know that. And so you go to the Barclays Bank where I served, Barclays Bank, which is the oldest English bank, 300 years old, and London is the head office. And you come, to, and I'm the banker, remember, I always want to be the banker. And you come to me, say, Mr. Banker, I want some $100 million loan. Would you extend that to me, please? Extend me, would you give me the money? Uh, look at the project. And I say, project is good. I say to you, you're the borrower again. Sure. We will be happy to lend you the money, $100 million, at 7% interest rate. You're happy, of course. You came there to get the money, the loan, and then you got it. The new thing is, you're about to leave the bank with this good news to give it to your friends in the office. I, the banker, will say to you, oh, don't rush. Please have a seat. Remember the good old story about have a seat? Remember that? Don't You better take the seat and run because every time you see this bad news, the seat is a, it's not a welcome place to sit after he says, okay, I'll give you the loan. Now he has a new story to tell you. He says, remember I told you? that we will give you the loan? He said, yeah, of course, thank you, sir. I said, the interest will be seven pay. Oh, yes, sir, I remember that, thank you very much. And then I said, this is new, get ready for this one. Then I said, boy, we guess. I also want part, a piece of the, of the project. I want also be the equity owner. I'll get the 7% of the bank will, plus I want 5% of the project share of the project, 5% as equity, in addition to the interest. Adding the equity 5% or 3%, however you want to negotiate is up to you in the bank. They're adding equity to the interest rate. So you're going to, the bank is going to get the interest rate, plus they're going to have a share in the project. Well, which is called equity, you know, shareholding is equity. By now you should be knowing all those things. That's what I taught you, I think, the first lecture, equity. So that's not great news, is it? So th these are the new ways. So if you want the project badly, you'll say, okay, I'll, I'll settle, I'll accept the equity part also, the seven, or oh, whatever, the 5%. Write it down, so I'm going to add something now. Because these things are not in the book. This is my own knowledge from being in banking. So, you know, the, you know therefore I can't give you reference. Go look at that book, you know, chapter this. It's not there. I'm sorry. You know, that makes my life easy for just yeah, chapter number 22 in the red, blue, orange, whatever color book it is you bought. And um, no, it, it can't be, it's not like that. And uh, the same goes, uh, you may have realized and that whatever number of definitions and all I've given you so far, I could give you a uh, go to chapter three for the, but in reading out the chapter number three or number nine or to look for one definition of a word there, uh, that finance term, you'll have to read the whole chapter. And you may not understand this whole chapter because some things are very complicated in those chapters. So I didn't want you to go around running out to look for one, one word, which I would just tell you myself, I would tell you, and I did, and then, uh, and save you time to, he said, he said, oh my goodness, chapter number 11, he said, would have a word that would have a definition of that certain word. And um, I can't seem to find it, but after five hours, you found it. And you say, oh my goodness, I wish I just listened to him, got the answer in two seconds or two minutes. 
Therefore, while I would like to give you, go there for this reference, go there for this reference, I can, but you'll be running around looking at all those references. Sometimes I do, will. Sometimes I will. Uh, you may have discovered in uh, last lecture, I think World Bank, episode number 30, some one or 32, IFC in the same way. In fact, the first chapter about equity, uh, organizational structures and all, uh, I did give you uh, the, the reference, go look it up because good half of the, my lecture was from that chapter number one, organizational behavior or something like that. I don't have the book in front of me. So yeah, uh, so not that I, I want to uh, not give reference, that's just saving you to, from having to running all over the book. But so, but I will only question what I will teach in the class. So make sure you get your notes in order. However, when I start talking the next subject like project finance, after finish part one, then we'll be project finance, which I may start. I will give you, I might give you three, four references. Okay, look at chapter this, 20, number 25, 24, 23. And then you say, okay, I can go and look up those. In fact, there I will, because I know that you can get something substantive, you know, something um, wholesome from that chapter, not just one, one definition. I said, okay, go look it up. So now we'll be, I'll be referring to some of the, the references in the book, okay? Especially in the project finance. I have a list of references I'll give you. So uh, the first half of the course was different um, because you'll, but on that subject, let me give you one reference at least. I was looking it up even today before starting the course lecture today. Uh, for some of the definitions I gave, some, not all of them, not in it, is in, in uh, chapter number five, the reference number five in the book. I know what's titled Mining Finance. I wish I had the book in front of it somewhere else. I can get it and give it to you. But anyway, uh, you may get maybe five or six, seven definitions there, okay? Uh, so that uh, might help a little bit. Okay, let's get back to why we're here. We talk about new mechanism to finance methods, MLPs, multi-limited partnership, equity position, equity share, where the bank wants a part of the ownership of the thing. Or the However, important. Whenever somebody says the word, however, careful, pay attention to what comes after the however. I may have, to, I may have talked about it before. I mean, you, if you, you don't want to disagree with somebody forcefully, just, I agree, but when, or however, the however means forget what I said. I'm going to tell you what I know. And let him feel good, he agree, but however, is a kind of yeah, whitewash what I said. And, uh, and when I teach petroleum agreements and I teach negotiations, and I generally use this technique in teaching the audience that, well, never forcefully disagree with somebody. There's no point in upsetting somebody. Say, oh, no, I disagree. No, no, nobody likes to be here that. So I say, yeah, you, you got a point. I know, um, I heard it. Uh, however, well, or if he's heard your however hundred times, say, boy, man, this fellow must have taken Dr. Malik's class and he, every time he says however means <laughs> this is a different story you're going to tell me, then use the word but with a single T at the end, by the way, but. Same thing, but if you say too many times, but go back to however. Anyway, that's just my <laughs> the negotiation technique. Now, why did I say however? That is, the banking regulations, uh, banking, in the United States, in some areas, are different from the banking regulations in Europe. This is one of them. For example, in the United States, no. Under banking regulations, the bank cannot take a equity position cannot be a owner, equity owner of a project that it is lending to. 
American uh, regulators, uh, bank people say, regulation say, make up your mind, Mr. Banker. You can't be both of the same project. Either you're a lender to the project or you are an owner, part owner of the project. You cannot be both. You can't put two hats. Not quite true in Europe. I favor the American regulations for a good reason. Simple reason, I like things that are simple because sometimes it so happens, especially when the project is a little wavy, you know, cash flow isn't coming the way you, it was anticipated, expected, Sometimes that situation may arise. In those situations especially, and something similar to that, the interest of the bank may be quite different from the interest of the owner of the project. Let it sink in. The interest of the bank might be totally different from the owner of the project, but if the bank, the lender, is also part owner of the project, he's got a problem. Which way is the bank going to vote as a banker or as an owner? American regulations keep you away from that. Don't tempt yourself to that, so you won't have to worry about it. And for that and that reason alone, I would say that is a good idea. You put on the hat, today I'm a banker, then put on the hat, today I'm an owner of another different project, not on the same project. Okay, so that way I would favor the banking regulations in Europe. When I said to you early in my first lecture, the part of the syllabus was that I always wanted young men, young women like yourself, students, to write a term paper, and some of them would write how the difference between the banking regulations in Europe and banking regulations in the United States was a very good topic. And I did explain to you as much as I want that to continue my practice of asking students like yourself to write a paper. I just had to discontinue because you could not go to the library. But that was my intent, physically go and look up the shelf, books on the shelf. So, and then the university was closed, you couldn't even go to the university. And that was not to, for you to open the computer and uh, internet and just take 10 paragraphs on 10 different books and put them together in some, some order and they say, here is the paper. That was not the intent. So now we can't do that term paper. I hope there would be a time we'll do it, okay. Let's move on to yet another subject, a new topic about for finance, whatever is left of the, uh, the first part of the course. I'm trying to wrap up that today. Write the word private placement. Private placement. Pay extra attention to this, please. So you say, well, no, what is a private placement? Again, in the case of private placement, it is between uh, big companies, not the small guys like me. Similar to commercial paper with one, some differences, but some way same, I'll explain that. Commercial paper, or you heard my lecture, you know, the, the chairman of Exxon could call up the chairman of Nationwide Insurance, there happens to be my insurance company where I insured my car, or some other insurance company doesn't have to be that. That's the name that comes to my mind. And said, give me, sir, send me over a check of about $30 million, but I want it for six months. 
which is a loan for six months, for short-term loans. The short-term loan, commercial paper is important. Short-term, 365 days to as low as in duration of one day, generally about three months or six months. You do not need in commercial paper regulatory approval. Remember the SEC regulatory body? Because you're talking about big boys or girls like Exxon and big boys or girls like Nationwide Insurance. These are called institutional investors, remember? Same way, with one difference. Private placement is similar to the, what I've just told you between two big, big boys or big girls, big institution there. They can, uh, for sh number one, it can be very long period. It could be over the life of the project, it could be 10 years. There's one, you see the difference? Like the similarities, like commercial paper, private placement does not have to have SEC approval. Again, we talk about big institutions talking to each other. SEC just wants to protect a little old man like me, not the big move institutional investors. So commercial paper, I'm, I'm gonna point out the difference now. People get confused. The short term, very important. Private placement does not need regulatory approval, the same as commercial, but it can be very long term. It could be over the life of the project. Lots of insurance companies, folks, lots of them, when they get your premium, hundreds of millions of dollars, what are you going to sit on it? They invest in all kinds of projects, cement projects, agriculture projects, real estate buildings, oil projects, all of these, can you name it, and they've got investments in all of them. Maybe in, in, in Tesla over here down the street where they build the plant. These are the insurance companies. We well, you know, they just sit at it. So they could be in long-term projects, why should they be short-term? But that's the difference. The difference is also one. The, no, the similarities, neither one of the two require approval of the company. But there's also one other difference. Commercial paper is lending for a period of no more than a year, not two. for private placement. A private placement can be either or or both. In case of private placement, the, the company can say, the insurance company say, okay, Mr. Exxon, you want $500 million? Half it is a loan for five years. 10 years, not one month, or more or less. Half of it is my equity. That means I want, I own half the project. They can do that. They can be an investor also in the same project and they can be lending money for a much longer period of time. This is not true with commercial paper. I hope you're getting the, the message, the differences and the similarities between the. Again, I want to emphasize, what are you learning here? That's not common knowledge in the street here, is it? The fine differences, the very fine differences between one financial product, but one financial instrument and another, find, these are the fine differences. That's why you go to Walmart. There's so many projects, one wants this one, one wants this, there's fine differences, very little difference between sometimes between two projects. But that's the point. I hope that that is, anybody can teach you what's a commercial paper, it doesn't take a genius to teach that. But the point of the, when do you go here? When do you go there? When do you do it? When do you do it? So let's go back. Now this is a private way. No regulatory approval, I'm just explaining it. Write it down. Number one, 
no re re uh, registration required, same as no regulatory approval. Because the private, between two individuals, two big institutions. And of course, when you're dealing with big institutions, whether the bank or the oil or Exxon, they are obviously sophisticated institutional investor. The private placement is not for a fellow like me running down the street. They're meant for well-informed, sophisticated with well-informed. Uh, write it down. This is not in any, any reference to the book. Then well-informed institutional investors. Generally speaking, oil annoys. The banks like to have a floating interest rate. Remember, we talked about prime interest rate, discount rate, floating interest rate, LIBOR. Remember all that? Floating with respect to the LIBOR or the discount per federal interest rate, and all that. We've already talked about it. In case of this situation with private placement, it is possible that you can work with an investor. It doesn't have to be a bank. At a fixed interest rate for 10 years, that sometimes can be advantages if you're getting a low interest rate, which we were receiving or giving or receiving, depending which way you're looking at it. In the last year, two, three years, really one, two, three years, like 1%, 2%. I was getting like 0 0.02%, 0 0.02, my heavens, like I haven't even looked at it, what kind of interest we're talking about. They're going to inch up a little bit slowly now. In fact, uh, there's a lot of speculation. It's almost like an open secret that the next meeting of the Federal Reserve Bank, the chairman is Mr. Powell, they said he, they may, the, the Board of Governors with the chairman sitting in the seat there, they may increase the Fed rate, Fed meaning, Fed rate meaning, Fed interest rate, for this one, by a quarter of a percent, one fourth of a percent, okay? Um, some Japanese banks are, uh, side story, side. <laughs> Banking is very competitive business. Everybody wants to lend to a, a good borrower who, does, who will always pay on banks. Japanese are very competitive. So here you have a quarter of a percent. The bank Cutting what one fourth of one percent difference uh, between one interest rate of charge by one bank and another by another one. This is the, because the, the Fed is going to increase it by a quarter percent. So this quarter will move on to the commercial banks. That, so one that that is equivalent to what they call in banking 25 basis points. One interest, oh yeah. This extra extra knowledge here. One percent interest rate is referred to have one hundred basis points. B A S I S. So if you, somebody said uh, the interest rate is one point two five percent, quarter of a percent, that is the interest is twenty five basis points. It is going up twenty five basis points. That's one quarter of a percent. So the banks sometimes go down in competition to one tenth of one cent. They call it 10 basis points. One basis point is one hundredth of a, per, uh, of a percent. So if you, so a quarter interest rate would be 25 basis points. The banks cut it to 
10 basis point rate of one tenth of a percent. I hope you understand that, but that's just an add on. Just trying to convey to you with this example, if you follow my example, that it, the competition is so very severe within banks. Another thing you have to remember about private placement is no public disclosure is required. By the way, I just thought of it. You know, as I'm lecturing, I'm saying, well, this might help, this might help. I've said in, in, you know, in the last 20, 15 minutes, the commercial paper versus um, uh, private placement, but somebody, the private placement can be long, commercial paper short. They say, sir, what about this bond? Bonds are long-term. You know, that's a logical question you should ask. And I said, well, in bonds, you're not an investor, you're only a lender. Remember that. The long-term bond, but in this case, you can be an investor, you can have a share in the project in case of private placement. In bonds, you can't have a share of the project. You see, so if I were to ask you a question, What's the difference between bond and a commercial paper and, and uh, private placement? I think you know what the differences are. In some way, they're the same, some way they're different, right? And they kind of mesh in. I know you're not all going to be bankers. It's nice to know these things. Not that everything is needed for your job next time you're looking for one. Just no, general knowledge, just general knowledge. Open your mind. Okay. I did say, that if you go to the SEC, going back lectures, it's public information. Everything has to be disclosed to the public. Remember that? Prospectus, everything has to be in the prospectus to get approval of the SEC. But business people don't want to discuss all the businesses in public. The advantage of private placement is, since you don't go to the SEC, so there's no public disclosure law you're required. You don't have to disclose anything in public. I think it's a big advantage. Maybe you don't, but that's your personal opinion. I don't want to disclose everything in the public. Maybe I've got certain information in my business that I want to be, have a monopoly. I don't want to be somebody else competing after learning from me with assignment. Again, when you go to the SEC, you have to have lawyers looking at the prospectus. You have to have a lot of printing going on because you're gonna pass out the prospectus to the public once it's approved and God knows what all is involved. Costly to the narrow. Case of private business, nothing to worry about. You talk to between investors talking to the lender, just two, two persons here and there, one on this side one. You don't have to have too much of legal expenses there. Longer term of the loan or the investment compared to commercial banks. You could be lender. And I will slow down so you can write down everything you want to write down. Well, if you want to really stretch your imagination, I'll throw in one more benefit of private placement. Just for the fun of it, I'll give you another one. If Exxon is a good company and they have on private placement, the other side who gave them the, as an investment, the national, nationwide company, my company, the insurance, and these, over the years, they have developed a relationship, the, the insurance company, the Exxon, they all come to develop a good relationship. Then what can happen? Then in the future, if Exxon wants a little more help from uh, the uh, insurance company and they've developed a longer relationship 
it's much easier to deal with a guy that you've worked with all the time in the past and no problem. Okay, so it's all I'm saying, I've written a good way to develop a relationship with the, with the, with the lender for future requirements. In other words, you know, if you're looking long term and you develop a good relationship for future needs, financial needs, uh, this may help. And, and vice versa, if it's not a good relationship, it's going to hurt you badly, okay? You can take it either way you want. That's the story of private placement. I'm going to write it down, then I write the word venture capital. Then we put a what in the world is a venture capital. Sources, are, all we talk about sources of capital from day one of this course, sources of capital, money, where did the money come from? So important. Let me write this down first. Just concluded the subject of private placement. Okay, take a breath now because we are going to move on to the subject of venture capital. Okay, venture capital. What in the world is that? Capital is money. Money for, for your venture. What is your venture? Your project. If it's oil project, you express production project. In order to help you understand this, what in the world is a venture capital? And many companies or many projects start with venture capital source of capital for the venture. I'll go outside the oil industry and then you can apply that concept to the oil industry. But the easier to explain when I go to the computer industry first to explain this. Many a computer company, I, I don't know, maybe most of them, maybe 90%, 70%, but I don't know, but lots of them, which are now huge, big, they started with as a venture capital from, from, as a, from capital, they started as a, from venture capital. The money they came from, got, they got was from a venture capital. I'll explain in a minute, don't be confused yet. What does that mean, the money they got was from? Let me explain. Uh, okay. There are many people like you. I mean, rich, really rich people like you have lots and lots of money. They don't know what to do with it. They never treat me at dinner. That's one way to spend it. They have invested here and here and here in stocks and real estate and everything they can imagine. And they've taken more risk here and less risk here. So these people, either individually or with others who have similar amounts of money, large of 
money, rich people. They, as a group, I'm talking with these rich people, then we'll talk with poor people like me in a minute. They come to me and assume that I'm a smart guy. <laughs> they made a mistake, maybe. <laughs> and they say to me, and say, okay, Mr. Malik, looks like you were a good investor, but we want you to take $10 million of my money and put it in a venture. I can put it in the bank, I know, but I want bank is the good thing is that there is no risk. I'm telling you, so you're talking to me. But they give you 1% interest. No, I don't like that 1%. I want to take, you take my $10 million and put it in a venture, into a venture meaning project, uh, which is not so, uh, not so conservative like a bank, you know, so there, there's some, some risk involved. So that I can expect, you know, maybe 8% return instead of one or two from the bank. So what I'm trying to say is, in this case, the so-called rich guy is willing to assume some risk to get a better return on his money. So he gives it to, to me, and there's another fellow, he hears about me that I have made other people a little rich and so on. They all come together, example, they give me 5 million, the other gave me 2 million, some get that. So now I've got 50, 60 million people from the people around and they want me to go ahead and look for good projects with the hope that I will invest money wisely and make them maybe even richer. And, uh, and of course, they know this. They will allow me to take extra risk. So the pool of money, the $50 million is called venture capital. You get it? And those who are putting in the money is called venture capitalist capitalist. That's a little background first. So I have this money in my, in my pocket, okay, to invest on their behalf, or I might put some $2 million of my own money. Doesn't have to be somebody else always. So I go around University of Texas, I, or some in the Silicon Valley or some uh, you know, somewhere where a lot of high-tech uh, people are walking around, you know, you know high-tech, you know, these computer guys. And I see one of them who looks very fuddy-duddy. You know fuddy-duddy? Have you ever seen a computer, super, super, super computer smart kid? What does he look like? There's a picture. I wish I was in the class with you. So you could explain to me what does a computer, super, super, super computer guide looks like. I'll explain to you, all the, I'll make it up. That Johnny has not shaved in, in two months. He hasn't taken a bath in six months. And you can smell it maybe a mile away because he doesn't take a bath. I'm just exaggerating, of course. Don't, if you're one of them, don't take it personally. I don't know if you are or not. And, uh, you know, he has never got to the barber. He didn't know what the barber does, you know. And boy, 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 he's a genius. With all these other things, I mean, it's a negative. He is a genius. He doesn't know we're like Dr. Malik, this fancy tie that you don't get. Oh, I change tie every time. Oh, my goodness. I, you don't get to see my tie. Oh, no. Trust me. Every day, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to put on pajamas underneath. No, I don't, I always dress up like I'm going to, uh, to, the, to the office, wherever I don't believe it. You know, so these days I hear that with remote, uh, what is the remote, what are they doing, the remote thing? Uh, if we go online, the people just, uh, just um, wear the shirt and underneath they've got underwear or pajamas or something because nobody sees them. No, 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 I don't do that. I dress up. I am, I, I, I'm looking for a way to show you my beautiful tie. Beautiful. A present from a nephew. And these are the colors of Norway. So he was a Norway brand, brought me this. Okay. Now you know, I'm a dandy friendly guy. Anyway, let's get back to this non dandy friendly computer guy. 
But that guy, I'm not smart, he's smart. That's the difference. I just waste all my time in wearing a tie and the knot. He doesn't give a damn to the knot. He said, to help with the knot, I'm going to, he's in his own world. So I am with this money from other guys and my own. Walk down and I see in the Silicon Valley, here's the Johnny, computer special. He's a genius, man. He's a genius. He's come up with a special computer program. I can't spell the word program. I don't know how many of you know what's the difference between the spelling of program with P-R-O-G-R-A-M or P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E. Do you know the difference? Let that be an exam question, okay? Go find out. I can tell you, but I want you to go look up the dictionary. The point here is, so I brought, the, I, I meet the Johnny guy, the super, super duper intellectual computer guy. He's got, you know, he's got his mind. He doesn't know what he's doing left or right, but he's on computer, he's the, he was the Superman. So I said to Johnny, hey, Johnny, come here, let's have a cup of coffee. So I talk him into having a cup of coffee and we sit down. And I say, hey, Johnny, you know, what are you doing? What are you, you computer guy I can tell. He say, yeah, I know computers, you know. So he explains to me maybe a program or whatever he's doing in the computer. I'm trying to explain how does the camp venture capital work. Just I'm putting all these funny things so that you don't go to sleep, you know. I think my lectures can be very boring. I can go to sleep in my own lecture. Even when I'm giving the lecture, I'm half asleep. So the point here is, <laughs> I'm adding all this. I've never seen a Johnny in my life, but I've made you so, feel like, like I live with the Johnnies. No, I have never seen one, but I assume what, that's what they look like. So I'm having coffee and I said, tell me what you do. And he tells me, this is what my you know, program does. And I said to myself, boy, this Johnny's idea of whatever he's doing, is bright. He's a super guy, man. It is very bright idea, yes. Tell me, is this Johnny a businessman? Those Johnnies are not business, and they don't care about your businesses. Just like you, people look down at the Johnny, they look down at the business. Yeah, hey, he's a three-piece suit, you know, with a tower is the thing he is. So, but I have realized that I don't nothing bro, but from what he tells me, I feel like there's a there's a hidden treasure there. But Johnny doesn't know it. Or if he knows it, he doesn't know how to, what to do with it. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what the capital is, what the money is, how to market it. Da, da, da. So I said, Johnny, you know what? Let's become partners. You tell me what you do, and I'll bring the money and the marketing genius, and then we'll work together, and we'll become very rich. We'll, I'll give you some money. I'll keep some money. So. The venture capital, you know, they gave the money to me. Their money is now going into the venture with the so-called Johnny. What's the expectation? That when this project you know, takes off, this price of a stock, if that's a stock, or the company is going to jump up and everybody, you and I, everybody who's put money there is going to be rich. Bank won't touch me because it's, too, it's still too early. They don't know about the Johnny business. But I'm willing to take the Johnny risk because I know there is a hidden treasure. I try five of these Johnnies, maybe three will pan out and be okay, two will not, overall I'll do okay. So that's what is a venture capital. You say, well, how about applying the same? And then, you know, you hear a lot of, uh, computer people, oh, we started in the garage business, you know. They, I don't know why they always start in the garage. Why, how come they all have garages? I did the, I was started in my garage. Yeah, it's a made up story. Everybody who, and I have a garage, I couldn't get any done things started out in my garage. There's an old car, 1990 model, 1990, that puts a 30, 32 year old car, hasn't moved in 12 years. There's no air in the tire. There's no money coming from there. The point is, 
or the super idea is coming, you know, my, you know, always say this computer guy, oh, I was the, my, I've spent two days, the garage, nothing came to me and I, <laughs> came as a bright idea. Maybe I should go move into the garage or something and I come out of it. Anyway, let's get back to Johnny's here and talk about this concept. Only to enliven up the boring lecture I've been giving you so that apply to the oil Similar. Oil business with the venture capital, let's say if I drill individually, if I drill one well, one well, two wells, and if I found oil, can I go to the bank with one well uh, producing oil? No bank is going to let you into the bank. Too risky. They don't know how long. How long will this oil flow out of the uh, well? Maybe another two weeks, or maybe a month, maybe two days. Three well, no. So the point is, there are sources going to the bank. No, don't even waste your time. So this is too risky for the bank. What I'm saying here is, you can go to a venture capital, you can come to me with $50 million, my friends. They told me to take a risk. No, I am willing to take the risk for my venture capital friends their money, they say, take a little risk. That one, two, three wells with oil in it may tell me there's a big you know, formation underneath there. It's not going to go dry. Banks don't want to take that risk. But I might, because I'm expecting a big elephant field, a big billion barrel fields. So I, that is called, so that's how some of the sources are from there, venture capital from people with lots of money. I've been saying all along, it just came to me, the banks are conservative. All people by nature are not conservative. I'm not the people talking people in the in the office, the oil office, in the offices of the oil car. I'm talking people that the, the, the wild catter they call it. They like like to drill a well here and a well there and, uh, and well here and hoping out of 10 wells, two will be, or five will, four will be dry and, and six will be big producers. So all people are not basically, otherwise they'll never drill a well if they make it so risky. That they will. Oil, maybe, maybe not 10,000 feet after you waste all your money, two feet, two miles below the surface, there's nothing there, but $20 million lost. What man would or woman would do will take that risk? Don't go to the bank. They say, get out of here. But if I have found two wells or five wells and three came out pretty good, I'm willing to take the risk. I've explained that to you. So why am why are banks conservative and oil people are relatively less conservative, very careful? Does it say in any book? No. What reference can I give you? None. Because I've not written the book to explain that. When I do, you can read it. But I can tell you now. Why are banks more conservative? When, simple question, when do you take risk in life? When do you not take risk? Common sense, you don't need a book to read that, to understand. Simple common sense. There's only one way some people take risk and others don't. It's simple from the time of Adam and Eve is the same concept. Simple, risk reward, that's it. You only take risk where you expect big reward. That's all. Why would you take a risk if the reward is very small? I would be foolish if I do. So what? If you go to the bank and you say, I'll give the money and the loan is 8%, he doesn't want to take a risk because even if you have a, a 500 million barrel field, what are you gonna give him as interest? 8%. You could be 
a multi-billionaire from his money that he lent you, he will still get what? 8%. Why the heck would he, would he take risk with you? Because he, his upper limit is limited. The upper you know, uh, reach where he can get to is limited by 8%. No matter how much money you're going to make, and all millionaire, he's willing to be in. He said, well, what if I hit the biggest oil well or oil field in America? I'll be the richest guy ever you ever heard about. I'll take the risk. Some people like to gamble, others don't. I don't gamble because I mine hard with money. I don't want to waste it on any gambling thing, but that's personal. So what it is it? You, you know, that's what all people are willing to admit uh, to invest in uh, risky, relatively risky. And that too is you know, relative, depending who wants to comment. Common sense. I, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I'm quite pleased with my explanation. As long as I'm pleased with my explanation, that's what matters. Whether you are not is your problem, not mine. It's common sense. Okay. Never think of those complex things in life. Please, for heaven's sake, listen to Dr. Malik. Keep life simple. Everything you can imagine in your life can be reduced two plus two. Have I said anything to you so far? The entire course, which is half, more than two, two thirds of the course is complete. That a fifth grader can, no, nothing of that. I don't believe in it. There's not, if you, the problem is when the person or the person teaching is confused himself and not quite clear, he then confuses the audience. And there was, none of these subjects are difficult, none. So please take it from me. Never be shy away from coming up with simple solutions to complex situations. Situation, I didn't say complex questions, situations. Look for simple approaches in life, remember that. I know you're young and you're nana. The moment the person on the other side is trying to make things complex, he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. Or he's trying to impress you. No point. Oh, life is too short to impress anybody. Live your own life. Live your own life. Don't worry about that. You know, we call it in Mark Jones. Forget about those Joneses. That's when you worry about the, the, the car, the Jones. He has a Tesla, I have a Maserati. He has a Lamborghini, I have a whatever the names are, Porsche. There's no limit, please. Live for yourself if you're happy. Who cares who has a Lamborghini or the Maserati or Porsche or Bugatti and all those fancy names. I'm trying to impress you, only no names, okay? That's all. But if you have a Bugatti, give me a ride on it. So I can then brag, oh, I've sat in a Bugatti. So let's see what is left to talk. Oh, the last thing we're gonna talk about, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the notes, is mutual funds. Why not? It's oh, well, well over an hour, we've been at it. Um, what should I do? Maybe should I take a break now? Because um, I was hoping to take a break at the end of this part uh, so that we start the new part fresh, but then that would be just a few minutes. I think we might as well. We might as well take a long break, not a long, but two short breaks because I need the other one more than this one. Uh, we talk about mutual funds. It's very important that you know what is the mutual fund. And so let's take um, let's take a twelve minute break, okay, please. And then later I might give you another five minutes. Then I need a little break there for you, you guys. I don't need it. You'll need it. And there's a reason I'll tell you why we'll take a little five or six minutes. Let's take a twelve minute, okay? I'm gonna let the screen show. And the twelve minutes from now on time, I shall be here, okay? Go get your drinks. Drink Coca-Cola or water, no, not the other fancy stuff.
Okay, let's start again, please. <clears throat> I hope you're there. Oh, well, well. The subject is mutual funds. You will be dealing or your money will be invested in mutual funds if you like it or not. So you better pay attention to what is a mutual fund. You say, well, if I don't like it, why would they put it there? Who is they? And then the question, why is it, is it good or bad? Can I control it? Okay. So let me give you the answers to all of these questions. When you are told you have a $100,000 paycheck a year, which is not uncommon for you bright young engineers like yourself these days, but you see your paycheck, the first paycheck, $100,000 would mean like $12,000, no, $8,000 a month, $96,000. Not going to be happy. 
call, instead of saying, expecting $8,000 and you're going to buy your fancy car, the Maserati you could talking about and, and all the things you've been dreaming about, you do go and do with that 8,000 and buy a big house or move into a fancy apartment. Oh, God knows what you're planning to do. You maybe see a check instead for about $5,000. Get ready for that. The reason is because lots of, there are lots of deductions, a lot of deductions from your paycheck of 8,000 that you, there's an initial shock, you know. You did not realize, you didn't expect, and then you left with, what did I say, 6,000, maybe 5,000, something. First of all, they're gonna take out your income tax on your behalf, that goes to the IRA, the government of the United States to pay their bill, which runs into trillions of dollars with a T, trillions of dollars every year. So whatever is left out of that, they've given to the government called through the IRS, the Internal Revenue, so that's the tax department. They're gonna take out some from your, for your insurance, medical insurance, before you see. You have to have that. Then they'll take out some for your many things like social security, about seven or 8% of that. If you sell employed like 14, 15%, it's coming out of your $8,000. And then to get to the point here, they'll be taking money out of your $8,000, putting aside for you, for you it's your money for your retirement thinking that what if you live long enough and you work long enough and you have going to live well after you retire they must now you must have some money saved up so they're going to take out your money from your paycheck now and maybe sometimes they'll match you their money with their money then maybe two percent of their and put it in your account in your account they're not going to take it out which you can't touch till you're 59 and a half year old, making sure that you have enough now when you turn time for retirement. So all these deductions, you're not gonna be left with a whole lot other than maybe five or $6,000. Let's focus on your money that they can take out for your retirement. I don't know who, who, how your money was gonna be invested, but generally speaking, almost 80%, 90% of the time, they are they are investment companies. Uh, they're like stockbrokers and investment bankers, and they're big names that you keep hearing about. They 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 help you invest, and generally they invest in mutual funds. I know you don't know what's a mutual fund, so this is why your money is, through them is going to mutual funds, most of it, if not all of it. Have I been there? Yes. See? And so you ought to know what that mutual fund does. Can it go up? Yes. Can it go down? Yes. It's an investment. Now let me explain to you then what is a mutual fund in case you don't know. Some do and some don't. Especially if you have some fine students from overseas, probably they don't know. Even the one here, they probably don't know, but definitely most certainly from overseas because they, especially at a young age, you don't worry about being a retirement. You say, I haven't even started my first job. I haven't even seen, seen my pay, first paycheck and Dr. Malik, what are you wasting your time talking about my retirement? I'm only 22 years old. Well, you'll be surprised how quickly time will pass. I won't be around to tell you how quickly the time has already passed. <laughs> I, I'm... No, I'm not going to be there. So let's talk about the business. Let us say, get the company now. This is how the mechanism goes. Let's say you could ten. Let's say you got ten thousand dollars. Why not? Well, you can say one thousand. Doesn't matter. Ten thousand feels good. And you want to invest in the oil business. There are many ways to invest in the oil business. You can become a partner in a part, limited partner in a partnership. Or you can buy stocks, or you can buy all kinds of stuff. 
all related to oil because you want to be in the oil business. And finally, you say, well, I want to invest in the oil business. I'll buy the stocks in oil company. So you take your $10,000 and you buy $10,000, you, one man, a woman, buy $10,000 worth of stocks of Exxon or Chevron or BP, one company. What's happening? You are taking an enormous risk. Exxon can do well and you make a lot of money and Exxon can go bad and you do a lot of money. You no, know, I don't want to lose that money. I heard her no money. I want to spread my risk, but I want to be the all business. So you take your $10,000, put it in four companies, Shell, BP, Exxon, and Chevron. So you're still in the oil business. Each company got $2,500. One company does better, the other one does not. So it evens out, hoping the average is out to be better than if you put all in one company. Then you say, well, <clears throat> I want to take even, be careful. I want to be, you know, take less risk than the oil. I want to, Let's say, okay, I want to uh, go in two, two industries. I want to be in the oil business and pharmaceutical. So you say uh, four, four uh, companies, uh, stock in oil and four in pharmaceutical, or oh, five and five. So thousand each in each company with your oil company, then thousand each in five pharmaceutical companies. So you've gone across sectors, industrial sectors, commercial sectors, half in pharma medicine, Pharmaceutical half. Oh, we want to spread more. You go one third, one third, maybe, or some ratio. Oh, we put in automobile, one third, one thing, pharmacy. Oh, you, have to, you, you, have, you can keep on playing that game. Okay. I want to put it in 10 different sectors. Well, I put in agriculture, I put in transportation, I put in shipping, I put in steel, I put in pharmacy, of course, oil is my favorite, and on and on. You can go, no, spread, spread, spread. and hoping the average will be in your favor. So what happens is there are individuals, that's all they do for a living, they work for a commission and they can advise you and they have other people like you in, the, in your company and other companies and they say, well, we will hire this company called American Express as an example, or in my case, Charles Schwab, and uh, or some insurance company, and I, I'll give my ten thousand dollar to them because they, I'm too busy with my work, and I don't know what's going on in this field, this field, this field. I'm so busy. They're the specialists, and they can keep an eye on us. So you give you ten thousand, I give my twenty thousand. Uh, Johnny gives us fifteen thousand. So I have like a million dollars that company to invest on, on your behalf, so they can put it. God, hundred different companies. Some of them have billions of dollars, B with the billions of dollars collected, billions of dollars, billions. That's all they do, invest your money. They are a good little commission. Spread the risk. Sometimes you say, well, I don't know about the American economy. It's going down, maybe the European might be going up. So you say, well, would have, and they'll tell you mutual funds, they have a prospectus, they lay it down and they tell you that, We'll put half the money out of the billion dollar now, not your little part, you know. Yours is a little part of a much bigger cake. You know, you, you've got only $10,000 or a billion dollars you know, that they are investing. They say, well, we'll put half in Europe, half ever in America. Then they were talking about in developing economy, the developing economy sometimes do very well. Okay, maybe we'll go in the Far East. Maybe those economies are doing well. So the point I'm making is constantly studying the world picture, you know, which economy is doing better as an example, which country is doing better, they can go, which industry is doing better, is it banking industry, I should put for money, is the steel industry. So all this collection of funds, which adds up to maybe $500 million from you and me and everybody else, that is called a mutual fund. It helps to spread the risk. If you want to do it by yourself, you can do it by yourself. The, the, like the stock, 
market, mutual funds are traded in the stock market, just like the up and down. You can you can buy a mutual fund of um, pharmaceutical and, and uh, called ABC or pharmaceutical and Exxon, and it'll be in the new, it'll be in the stock exchange if they go through the public offering, and you can do it yourself. But most people don't do that. They rather give it to the specialist. Some do want to do it, them they can. So it's basically spreading the risk. Some want to, some want to do this. Generally speaking, there's no yes and no, not fixed formula. Everybody has a different approach to how to invest. Generally, the, the big companies, the big, big, the huge companies, they, the growth is relatively slow because it's a, it's a big, like a super tanker cargo. Now they move slowly like a jumbo jet. Okay, but they grow, but they give out dividends. Okay, the most secure. You're not going to lose the big cargo. You're not going to sink very quickly, is it? So they're going to be around for a while, like so on. But they they give out dividends every three months. Maybe they won't. You know, but generally they give the, that you can use, like you know, for retirement purpose. S small companies, generally small. And they've got lots of enthusiasm. They sometimes do take off in the stock price. Sometimes they do. And they, you do very well. And some on the other side, they disappear. They bankrupt. They're too small. They can't take that. And the, 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 the push of the wind uh, or the economy, wind here is the economy. And they wonder, Exxon is not going to be affected that badly by the economy. It is, everybody is affected, but not as badly as a small company that can disappear in bankruptcy. So this is how the, uh, most everybody's money is invested, most everybody, okay? Uh, hoping that when you retire, all that money over the next 40 years, you they've been taking it out of your paycheck, and you may have maybe 10, five, 10 million dollars, not, not uncommon. I think it'll be fairly common in your bill. What you're getting and you'll be getting, you may have 10, 15 million dollars at the time you retire. What the 10 million dollars is worth today is a different story. That's a different story. <laughs> you know, yesterday something got into me about this time, they call it time value money. That, this is really with myself. I, I was lying. I said, "What?" Because my my daughter lives in Houston. And she's an EMR, okay, and has a nice job and all that good stuff. And the fellow comes to mow her yard. It, it has to do with what we're talking about, you know. Cut the grass. And about two, three months back, or four months back, I asked her. Her name is Sarah. I said, you know, how much? What do you pay the your fellow? And I said, well, "What do you pay a guy?" He said, I pay her $25 an hour. I said, okay. Said, Two days back, I called. I was talking to her. In fact, she's expected here in about a year and a half from Houston. She's come to see me. I said, well, no, no. she was talking to me. I said, well, and that's what she said, volunteer. He said, you know, I have increased his income or salary. I used to pay him to, this is exactly she's told him. Now I pay him $30 an hour, $30 an hour. I said, okay, all right. Then last night, I said, oh my goodness, that's a fact. You will not believe it. And I know you say, I, my grandfather says the same. When I graduated from the University of Texas here, where you're sitting today, and, and, and from my first master's degree, no, well, that was my second master's and I got a PhD later. I had a master's in geology. There's a reason I'm telling you. A master in petroleum engineering from University of Texas, okay? In May of 1972, I graduated from the second master's, no, 40 years, 50 years ago, okay? And I got a job, no. Yeah, I did get a job in Austin. Two masters, two masters. This, my daughter is paying this fellow $30 an hour. And I calculated, you know what I was making? I had two master's degrees, from, one from UT Austin, from our department. You know, Cinco, $5 an hour. That was the salary I was getting. No, not that it was a, uh, 
And they were cheating me. That was the salary of, uh, that I received. And I was quite happy. I saved money out of that. I did very nice. I was very comfortable. I mean, more than you can imagine. Five dollars. Now the, the fellow who pushes the, 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 the grass cutting guy is getting $30 an hour. And I was bragging about it two degrees. Five dollars an hour. <laughs> can you imagine now? This is just, I know you've heard this from your great, great, great granddad. Either. I know that. But uh, knowing the subject of economics, I still can't get over it. You know, I, that guy is making five times more on minimum wage than the super duper UT Austin graduate. Later, I got my pay there. there no. <laughs> well, so what I'm saying is the ten million dollar. You know, they, you know, I know you started daydreaming. You know, Dr. Malik, I'll have ten million dollar winner. You will. I guarantee you will. I don't know what to buy, maybe two loaves of bread, or God knows. Anyway, that's a mutual fund, okay? The reason I gave you the story now about my $5 an hour, that was what I got. To give you the good news, it's over. What is over? It's over. What it's over? What is it? Remember I said to you, two seconds. Today, with this lecture now, we have finished the main thrust of the course. Finished. I know it's bad. finito, I guess. Caputo, whatever it is, don't worry about it. Sources of capital. I hope you remember one tenth of it, you're done okay. I hope so, you know, I, till the exam you probably will after that. But if you if you've taken notes, that's all it takes. You can't put everything in and keep it in. Take notes once in a while, you'll need it. Hey, you know, Dr. Malik said, me, so let me see what he said, okay? So uh, that's the good news. That part of the course, the sources kept is over. And now the second part will start, and I'll give you a little break so that we break the first. That's a big juncture in the in the class, the, in the course. But I'm going to go over the list of items that we have covered, so you feel good that we've done well. Okay, with all the lights and the, the light jokes and all that stuff. Because otherwise it could be boring, man. Finance is not an exciting stuff. It's not a comedian show here, but I try to make it, you know, okay, okay, keep interested. So I have a list of items that we have covered. If you want, you can uh, take note of it. What are the sources of loan and equity? Debt and equity, remember we started with two sources, debt and equity, we have covered them. What are the sources? Number one, it's in no particular order. And I have it written down. International agencies. Remember, we talked about last time. Multilateral. You want to write it now? I'll, I'll slow down. Multilateral banks, World Bank, IFC, International Bank. Multilateral. We've talked about it. Another one. Government export. Financing agencies, we talked about recently. Remember Exim Bank, EX-IM, Export Import Bank of the United States and all industrialized countries have it. And I said that Boeing will be happy to get Nigerian airline or some airline, Egypt Air, money as long as you buy Boeing from America. So we talked about it. Host governments. Especially, the, I remember in the good old days, LNG was new, liquid for natural gas. And Japan was very keen to get as much gas as they could as liquefied because they don't have gas. They, that was the fastest growing economy in the whole world. The second biggest economy in the world was Japanese out of nowhere. It's, not, it's China now. Well, China is not the biggest, is the biggest now. People have already talk about the, the biggest. That's the biggest mistake people make. You'll read too, China is the second big, no, they're not. Look up IMF, International Monetary Fund. Remember we talked about it? No, what you read, you'll have more meaning to it. You'll have to begin to enjoy what you read. IMF, look up, just say IMF, go to Google. What is the GDP, the, the size of the economy, the gross domestic growth of China? And then put on what is the GDP? It'll throw you out. It's IMF, the whole body that everybody of USA. Read it yourself. We give oh my no, it's not. If IMF says that, you have to, who do you have to believe then? 
if not them. You'll see the numbers there. Now let me be, learn this now, please. There's something called PPP. Learn this, it's important. Purchasing, purchasing, like purchasing, buying, power, parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y, buying power parity. Write it down, it's important. These things you have to know as knowledge. Please, for heaven's sake, just not know about what goes on the campus. Oh, broaden your horizon, open your mind. You're a young kid, you've got to take it, you should be like absorbing it. What is PPP? Purchasing that is buying power parity. Let me explain. Very important. What is it? $1. In America, can't get you very much. Nothing. Nothing. You can't even afford to leave a tip of a dollar. They'll throw it back at you. But one dollar in China can buy, or any developing country, can buy a meal for two people. In the, at least it's not in Shanghai or Beijing, in, in, in the village somewhere can buy noodles and all that good stuff, two or maybe three people in Chinese currency. It will, I've been to China more than once. Here, the fellow let you leave a dollar here at a tip, the fellow you're leaving it, he'll pick up the dollar and run behind you because you left the hotel restaurant. He says, sir, you forgot your dollar. He said, that's no sir, that's not my, I think you can use it yourself. He's insulting you. By what do you think you are dollar? China, no, three people, two persons could buy them. In the old days, like 10 people could buy them. I'm even being realistic. Two persons, at least two, at least two can buy. No, no, I'm not talking take filament or steak. I'm talking with noodles and something. That is a dollar buying power in America is worthless. In China, way up here, or relatively. So if you compare, this is what IMF does. That is the only way to do it, perfect way. The buying power, purchasing power of a dollar here, worst thing, purchasing power of a dollar in other countries. In some countries, a hamburger could be $10 here, the hamburger may be $4. In Japan, I don't know how many probably done. So if whatever a dollar can buy here and a dollar, can, if you look, and that is the one and the only good way to measure, the, compare the two economies of nations. Under that criteria, and I believe in only that, look up Google or whatever, Google, whatever you want to look up. IMF has released it. I have it, but I don't want to, be, I'd have to make a photocopy and all that stuff, you know, you can look it up yourself. In that case, China is already the, for two years, already the biggest economy in the whole world, by far, not the United States. So that's what I'm trying to say. I don't know how we got into this. We have to open, keep an eye. You see, that's called GDP, host domestic product. So what I'm saying, oh, it came to host government. So in Japan, not now. 15 years back, it was not China. Japanese, Japanese economy was the second largest in the whole world. Out of nowhere, Japan, a few, I, by the way, I think I read today that they got hit very badly by, um, by some uh, uh, sea, what is it, tidal waves and all. And it, it almost like a tsunami. I hope the people didn't die. So in that case, Japanese government was paying the LNG producers money, capital, to develop the LNG plants and ships so that they can bring the host, they were the host government, LNG to Japan. So they, sometimes the host governments do that also. The commercial banks, of course, you know that. So host governments is a source. Commercial banks are a source. And we've talked about all of this. Write it down. We've talked with institutional investors. We've spent a lot of time, you know, big insurance companies, an example of pension program, institutional investors.
leasing companies. We have talked about leasing at length as a source because it eliminates the need for capital because now you're renting instead of, so you don't need the capital, you can rent it. It's not like they lend you the money, they lend you the equipment that eliminates the need to, to borrow money to buy. So it serves the same purpose. Venture capital companies, we spent half an hour talking about it today. All these are sources of capital. Wealthy individuals like you, Sometimes companies who, who supply raw material for a finished product at a factory or a, or a mill, they can also provide you the source of capital. They want to get rid of their raw material. If, if they've got too much cotton and they want to make cloth of it, and they, they say, okay, we'll lend you money to buy a cotton so that you can make cloth and when you make it and you sell it and you can return the money, you know, all kinds of sources of capital. Contractors, of course, trade, oh, of course. How can we forget trade creditors? Remember last time we talked about trade credit? Whatever, I think I gave you a list of about a dozen of them. So I have to feel good or not good myself whether we have spent time well or not well in the semester. I think I'm quite pleased. I have to answer to myself and nobody else that I'm pleased that uh, my mission was to educate you in this source of capital. As long as I feel my mission is being accomplished, I'm pleased. And I think I've done okay as far as I'm providing a service to you young people. So you will one day remember that, yeah, we heard it from Dr. Mark. That really concludes number part one. We can either go and call it quits for the day and start part two for the next lecture that can be done. My temptation is to give you a six minute break, just, to, just a short break, not a long one, to introduce you what is coming at part two, okay? I won't give you a long story, okay? And then to introduce you to what's going to happen ahead. So sources of capital is over. Maybe 75, maybe two thirds of the course is over. One third of the oil price and project finance and all these things are left. I can talk about it. I'm looking at the watch, six minutes. And after that might be 15, 20 minutes and then we'll call it quits. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you in just, I'm taking the, the second break just to give you a different mindset. And you put too much in the What happens, you, you got a bucket full of water, you put more water, it spills. So I don't want to overload your bucket of water in your, that's your brain, okay. Don't, only six minutes.
Can you read <clears throat> okay. The subject today is project finance starting now. It'll be next lecture. I'm just giving you an introduction today. Very likely it'll be the next lecture after the next lecture. It might be one and a half, maybe even two lectures, depending on uh, how deep or do I want to go into that, okay? So this just to get you thinking is, is uh, on the subject project finance. So first question is, what do I mean by project finance? Then we talk about retrospective and all that stuff. Simple, project finance is where whoever is lending you the money, the bank, we talk about borrowing and lending, is relying, depending on getting the money back from the borrower, essentially from the cash flow of the project. So the bank says, we are giving the money to 
based only on the project that is a good project. And as a good project, it'll produce some revenues. And from those revenues, we'll get our money back that we're giving as a loan now. So the focus is what? The project. You have to look at the project every way possible that it is a good project. So they're relying more on the project, less on the company, but they're relying on the company also, but really they're more and more and more extremely careful in assessing the usefulness, the good, the worthiness, how good or great is the project because they are relying on their money coming back to them from the cash flow generated by the project. I've said it, same thing twice. That is one way to start a project. You say, well, compared to what? Many times in most instances, the bank looks at the balance sheet and the income statement of the company. They're looking at the project, but they're relying more on the balance sheet and income statement, because if the project goes bad, we can get to the company's balance sheet and get the money from there. So what is a balance sheet, you ask me? I've written it. Oh, I've not, did I? A balance sheet is written here, is assets, what the company owns, minus liabilities, what it has to give out. That is a balance sheet. In other words, a balance sheet is like a picture, a snapshot of a company at one given moment in time. Now, it's like a photograph. A balance sheet is a photograph of a company at any given moment in time, typically maybe December 31st of the year. So what is the company looking like? What are the assets of the company on December 31st? Do you have? What do they have to give out? Is liability. The rest is theirs. That is the value of the company. What they have coming, what they have going out, coming minus going out, that is called the net worth, net value of the company. That is their company is worth that much to them. Simple. So put on the asset I'm pointing out to you is minus liabilities is written here, a third line from the top, because maybe it's not dark enough. Because assets minus liability is the net worth of the company. That is the value worth of the company at a given point in time, like a photograph at that time. Net worth, you could call it equity, same thing. Net worth, same as equity. Simple. So now you know what is a balance sheet. In the case of balance sheet, it talks about the company's past performance, financial performance in the past. How has the company performed historically? What did they do last year? How much were the assets? How much were the revenues last year and the year before and the year before? From that, they can tell is the company's value getting higher and higher or are they getting smaller and smaller in value? So looking back last year, the year before, a year before, prospect that is called a retro, the word I've written second from the top line is retrospective. In the past, retro means going to the back and looking at the balance sheet is a res, retrospective approach. Is that clear? So when the company is looking, when the, sorry, when the bank is looking at the company balance sheet, it is looking at a retrospective. How did they do the years in the past? Maybe three, four years. So the approach is looking backwards. The other approach is to look at 
what have the revenues of the company been in that given period of time, which is typically a year? How much revenue did the company get in this year? Year. The first one is point in time. This one, revenue this year, and then how much expenditures in this year? How much money came in? How much money went out as expenditures? Common sense, basic kindergarten. Coming in, revenues minus expenditure is what? Money in your pocket, that is your net income. Net income. This is called income statement. So if so, you keep hearing all oh, the balance sheet of the company, all oh, the income statement, this is it. How more easy can I make it, folks? What are your revenues this year? $100? What are your expenditures? $80? This year, your income of $20 or $20,000 or $20 million. That's all. So now you know what is it. And this is for the project. Remember, we have to look at in the future because the project finance, the project does not exist. We are speculating, we are thinking, if you give the money for the project, what do we expect in the future? They build the project, they build the drill the well, and what do they expect from the well? Sell the oil. And how much revenue will they get? next year and how much expenditure next year, what income will they have next year from which they can give us back the debt service, the principal and the interest and you know what is debt service, I've told you that. So they're looking at the future in case of a, what income statement. That is called a prospective future approach It's on the second line from the top. Prospective approach, looking into the future Balance sheet is a retrospective looking in the back. Perspective is a future approach looking in the future. And project finance is what? Project finance is the money, the bank expects the money from the project to pay back the loan, the cash flow from the project. So that's all. So simple. Taking out the mystery of income statement and Balance sheet, Carly, what more easy can, how more easy can I make it? Just tell them. This is, this is uh, I, well, I don't want to brag about it, but that's about easy as it can, anybody can make it for you. So now you know what is project finance. Now you know what is the balance sheet. It is at a given point in time, like a picture. Well, now you know what is an income statement that is for the whole year. Money coming in, money going out. Income, how much money, how much profit did you make? Did you make any profit? Did you lose any money? So income statement is also called profit and loss statement. Same thing, profit and loss. If you made money, it's a profit. You lose money, then it's a loss. As for the whole period of time, typically the year, that's a difference. It's in the future versus past. Retrospective versus perspective. So that is where we'll stop today. And I'm looking at the time, it's four o'clock. So uh, we'll fill in a lot of details about project finance. As I said, they'll take us maybe one and a half lecture, maybe two, I don't know. And I will give you the references because this uh, is definitely an area where I can give you the references. Uh, let me see. Uh, I know I do have some references already. Uh, I think it's reference 20, I, I should not mislead you in that book, you know, that we have 20, I don't know, the 22, 23, 24. Those references are coming to my mind um, that uh, will help you if you want to be ahead of me. That you, so now I've already given you references ahead of time. So my lecture is, you know, good part of my lecture in project finance will be from those, from those references, okay? Yeah, I see that reference 20. Uh, let's see, reference, oh, yeah, 19, I see 19 written here, because I prepared this lecture, with the reference 25 I've seen here for my lecture, reference 22 for my lecture, next time the one after that, uh, and reference 20. 
and number 25 if I want. So I've already know. <laughs> it's a totally different approach. Uh, some of these things you're going to find there. I'm not telling you even ahead of time. Okay. And so um, if you're going to go ahead of me, uh, that's okay, but I will cover it. Not that uh, whatever I cover, all of it will be in that reference, but good part will be there. Okay. And uh, so you prepare yourself. Again, if I haven't taken a reference 20, I'm looking at it. Did I give you reference five? I think I did. That was for the previous, like uh, what's commercial paper and all that, under the definition of financial terms. That's in that, those references number five, I think. But the ones I'm giving you, number 20, uh, these are for project for 19, uh, 25, 22 reference, 20 reference again, 25. Because this is the sequence I'm going to be teaching, therefore I have it um, 19 coming before or after the 20, because it is the sequence I did. Okay? Enough said. Now you should be happy you got the references. You say, well, why in the world did you buy the book? No, now you know the worth of the book. Okay. And last time I gave you the World Bank and the IFC also, and number one, the organizational structure. So the work book is getting to be more and more useful. What else can I do for you? Have a good day. See you next time. Bye-bye.